Hello, and welcome to today's virtual Commonwealth Club program. My name is Farhad Manju, opinion columnist at the New York Times, and your moderator for today. As the club continues to host virtual events, they are grateful for the continued support of their members and donors. We hope you will also consider making a donation or text donate to 415-329-4231. Today, I'm pleased to welcome Matthew Iglesias, author of the new book, One Billion Americans, The Case for Thinking Bigger. At this critical juncture in American history, Matthew outlines, Matt, outlines that the United States needs to quite simply be bolder than it has been over the past several years. And uh, you know, if there ever was a time for boldness, now is the time. Matt, it, Matt is a co-founder and um, senior correspondent of uh, the news website Vox. He also hosts the political podcast The Weeds and is a regular contributor on NPR's All Things Considered. We'll be discussing a lot in the next hour, so just a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please submit those in the chat box. Okay, Matt, thanks for thanks so much for joining us. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for having me here. All right, so let's talk about the big idea of your book, One Billion Americans. Are you really asking us to accept 700 million more people in here? I am. It's like uh, 670 million people, I think, okay. um, yeah. you know, added up, be technical. And so, you know, you and I, we used to, um, we used to work at Slate together and, you know, it's a slatey idea. <laughs> Yeah, so Slate sometimes had the reputation for, you know, just like trolling and, you know, some piece about how Creed was good, something like yeah. that. But I, I think at its best, you know, what, what we tried to do there was like be provocative, not just say things that everybody was saying, right? right. So this is kind of a, you start as like a thought experiment, right? Mm -hmm. Like people say the US, China, oh, it's competition. So like, what would it take, right, for America to stay number one? Forever. Uh, we're a rich country, you know, we should try to grow the economy, but we just can't grow as fast as these poorer countries that are, that are catching up. Uh, but we could have more people, right? Um, a lot of people want to immigrate here. Uh, we spend like a ton of money trying to keep them out. Um, mm -hmm. Americans have children, but not as many children as they say they want to have. Uh, we could have more. We could give people money. We could provide childcare. Uh, so like, why not? Like, why not do it? Right? So then there's like obvious objections, like, oh, it's too many people, right? It's going to be mm -hmm. like, I don't know, it's going to be Hong Kong. Everyone's going to be crammed in like sardines. So, you know, is that true, actually? And it turns out it's, it's not true. At, at a billion Americans, we would have the population density of France. We'd be at about because half. There's, just, there's yeah. just a lot of places in America with not a lot of people. Yeah, America is very... It's empty. There's a lot of, uh, what do they call it? Amber waves of grain. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> still out there. Um, it's just, this country's really big and it is not that densely populated. And, you know, this stuff gets historically odd, right? So we have 330 million people. In Canada, they have 35 million people. Um, we made policy choices much earlier in our career to get a lot of people here. And it's very deliberate. If you look at, you know, George Washington's administration, obviously uh, a lot of racism in that time, a lot of stuff going on that we would not stand behind today, but yeah. also a real interest from him in welcoming immigrants to build up the country into a major power. Abraham Lincoln and his sort of State of the Union, they didn't do it as speeches. He, he just wrote a letter, which was nice, actually. Um, but, you know, he says in 1864, he's like, well, we actually need to, it was totally open borders then, but he said mm -hmm. they had to put more money into like opening offices in Europe to tell people about how good it was to come to America. <laughs> like marketing, marketing for. <laughs> yeah. Open. Well, because they had this um, uh, Homestead Act and, you know, big civil war obviously happening. So it's like, we should get some more people, right? Yeah. And, you know, part of the thinking of the book is like, well, we should go back to that kind of thinking that is very embedded in moments in our history to think of people it's as not, an asset. It's not like a, a huge departure from how people thought about the country, like just a little more than a hundred years ago. Right. I mean, exactly. And, you know, and of course, like we had a much more rapidly growing population in the fifties and sixties. This was the the baby boom era, people are having over three children uh, mm -hmm. per family. I don't think we would go back to that. I mean, preferences have shifted. But people say they would like to have two to three kids on average, but instead they're having one or two kids on average. Right. Right. And, you know, by eyeball, that doesn't seem like a huge 
difference, right? But in the aggregate, if you're having 1.5 children per family rather than 2.5, that means much smaller, much slower population growth in, yeah. in the aggregate. So those kind of modest shift, but like year after year compounding makes a huge difference over time. And we have the space for it. Like uh, at triple our population, we're still only half as dense as Germany, nowhere near as dense as the UK. Yeah. And people go to those countries. I mean, you can say what you want about like the English food or something, but it's not like, it's not like there's no room, right? Like they've right. got nice sheep and, you know, yeah. all kinds of other stuff. So, so I, um, you're in me, you're kind of preaching to the choir. I mean, I, we worked together at Slate and I sort of, uh, kind of inspired by your kind of early Yimby writing. Like I, I'm, uh, into that. <laughs> I've called for open borders. I think that we could, um, uh, you know, be like, I, I like the, um, the places I've lived in, in America are mostly California. And, you know, those places have been very welcoming, or at least there've been a lot of immigrants there. And I think that life is made better by immigration, like even for people who live here. But um, so, so I'll try to ask some critical questions and I hope our audience does too. But <laughs> like the first thing is, um, so you've gone over like why we, that we can do it, but why should we do it? Like what, what benefits would we get from it? Yeah, so I mean, there's sort of international benefits, right? I mean, trying to maintain our leading posture on the world stage, right? That we're seeing things like, um, there was this PEN America report uh, two weeks ago, and it was about how Chinese movie censors, they used to say like, oh, you can't put that in a movie if you want to show it in China. Now, mm -hmm. you can't put it in the movie at all. Right. right, because they now have the number one box office in the world. So it gives them incredible leverage. You can't walk away from the China market. You saw when Daryl Morey, the general manager right. of the Rockets, tried to express like solidarity with protesters in Hong Kong. He got smacked down. There was this really embarrassing thing where some piece of marketing for Mercedes like quoted the Dalai Lama. And I, I don't even know why you would quote the Dalai Lama selling Mercedes. I mean, there's a lot of cynicism in marketing, <laughs> but it was like a huge uproar. And the CEO of Daimler winds up issuing this like groveling apology for the right. offense he's No, given. and you see this with companies all the time. They're like mm -hmm. the way that kind of Apple is with its privacy policy here or um, versus its uh, how it thinks about privacy in China or just right. security. Um but you you think that is that primarily just a difference in market size? If we were a bigger market, um, then the companies wouldn't have to sort of count out to China in that way. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's you know you would get more leverage, right? You can do things on the policy front. Like I don't totally understand what's happening with TikTok right now, but it's it's something is happening. Um, right. You know, and and the bigger we are, right, the more our regulatory dictates can have weight in the world and decisions. So we could try to do things. We could try to say, look, you're not going to be allowed to release a movie in America if you submit it to the PRC censors, right? right? Like you got to pick, right? Yeah. But then we still need to create a situation in which people are going to want to pick us. There would be an incentive right? to choose and, our regime versus theirs. Yeah. And you see this in like little things, right? That are not politicized. Like we, um, the Obama administration made tighter regulations for water efficiency and appliances. And Trump complains about this sometimes. He like, he says you can't flush toilets anymore. I, I think you can. Uh, but the great news about regulation in America is like people argue about it. But when we say you have to do something, companies do it by and large, right? Because you can't just walk away. You can't just say like, I don't care. I'm not going to sell dishwashers to the United States anymore. Little countries don't have that privilege, right? If you're New Zealand, you just sort of got to take it. Like whatever's out there. Right. You got to hope right. somebody makes good rules. Somebody so had a, a, a sort of sufficiently large market and called for safety regulations. Yeah. And, right. and you can and you can just kind of piggyback, right? right. Uh, so it's, it's useful to sort of be large there. Uh, but then I think there are benefits to growth just domestically, internally, right? So when you have big cities, you have sort of deep, complicated markets for services and skills. You can have sort of better matching between customers, employees, workers. People can do more things. People can fill more interesting niches. Um, you know, you and I are both in, you know, sort of digital media for a long time. Um, and because America is big, 
you can reach if you can reach one percent of the American population with your podcast, like yeah. that's a crazy success. Zero point one percent, right? And you can you can get somewhere. Whereas if you look at like I don't know, like Danish language podcasting. Is like just not that vibrant. There's not enough right. people there, right? right? Only something very generic can play to that market. Yeah, so well, as we, yeah. One thing I sort of gathered from your book, and I hadn't really thought about it in these terms before, is like one reason to have more people is just to have more cities. Like, and because because a lot of a lot of growth and a lot of kind of innovation and just kind of more um, economic activity these days because of our tech, because of technology and otherwise, kind of seems to happen in these densely packed urban areas. Right, exactly. And we could, we can uh, help revive some areas that, you know, uh, Detroit is famous, St. Louis, I think we don't think as much about, but has lost over 60% of its population. Uh, then lots of smaller places like Cleveland and Cincinnati, um, Philadelphia, even Baltimore are way down from their historical peak populations. And, you know, you can look at any one place and you can say, well, you know, like the mayor there really screwed up. They got to do this. They got to do that. Uh, but almost every city in the Midwest and then in the Northeast, most of the smaller cities mm -hmm. have lost people and they're still shrinking. Because when everybody is leaving, I mean, I think this will be hard for if, if you're in the Bay Area to imagine, but cities can get too cheap, right? Yeah. Like if you get it, affordable is good, like people can come in and find a nice place to live. But when you get to a situation like in Milwaukee, where buildings market price is below what it costs to build new buildings, uh -huh. that means nobody wants to build things. Landlords don't keep up their properties. There aren't, I mean, there's not work to do, but also homeowners, you know, if you, if you own your home and something breaks, like you're going to get it fixed, yeah. whether it makes economic sense or not. But that kind of sweat equity is just sort of wasted instead of an opportunity for people to build wealth and right. build value. So something that we get with growth is the ability to have, it's like, it's not literally true that a rising tide lifts all boats, but if the tide is rising like a lot, it's it's easier to make sure all the boats rise. Right. One one difficulty with this is that you know when we, the immigration that we have now, a lot of people go to the big cities where there are already a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So if we open up uh, the borders, if we make you know immigration easier, how how do we make sure? Because as part of this to work, you'd want them to go in places where they're not going now, where not a lot of people are going now. So how do you change that? Like for various places that have, you know, places like Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, one idea is to try to decentralize the economy somewhat. Um, and we don't know. I mean, some people think with COVID and, you know, people doing a lot of right. Zoom stuff that that's going to happen naturally, which would be in some ways, great, right? I mean, I don't know. I, I, I love cities. I, I have mixed feelings about the idea of people sort of abandoning downtowns. Uh, you, I know, were, I've been a, been a work-from-home guy for a long time. Uh, yes. may, may, maybe cheerlead for it. Uh, but either way, so like that's one thing that may happen, right, is economic opportunity may naturally spread out. Uh, if it doesn't, we could try to spread it out, right? We could try to say, look, Amazon, when you're doing your HQ2 stunt, like don't, don't go to New York. Right, like let's let's shift this activity to places that need it. Uh, government agencies, I've talked about moving some of them out of the D.C. area and into cities that you know have overbuilt infrastructure and cheap housing and smart ways to do it. We could also directly target immigrants, right? So in Canada, one thing that they have is the province of Quebec sort of gets to sponsor like special immigrants on its own because uh, they want to find people who speak French. Uh, we probably don't want a special program for French speaking immigrants, uh, but we could say, look, that cities that want more residents get bonus visas that they can allocate, you know, and say right now we have like these H1B programs and other things where people come and they have to work for a particular company. So we could say, well, instead of that, you have to stay in a particular city. Uh, and if you do that, you sort of do your five years and you follow the rules, then you can convert to a regular green card. You know, people might just leave after that. But also a lot of people, like once you live someplace for a while, you put down some roots, you know people, uh, you know, ethnic communities develop it. People, a lot of times immigrants will move to just places where other people from the same culture mm -hmm. 
you know, have moved in the past because I don't know, you know, you got food and religious institutions yeah. and, and other things like that. Uh, so I, I think we should experiment with that. The, the U.S. Conference of Mayors endorsed an idea along these lines. Pete Buttigieg talked about it a lot during his campaign. Mm-hmm. I think it's like a footnote somewhere in the Biden plan. Uh, but it, it seems like a good idea that, you know, whether you want a billion Americans or not, but especially if you do, it would make some sense. Yeah. So, um, I mean, to me, it seems like one of the main problems with trying for this is that is, is more cultural and just sort of like culture war part mm-hmm. of it. Like uh, immigration is, is just kind of one of those polarizing issues that always seems to be, you know, uh, a, a winning issue for the right or, um, and especially in, you know, bad economic times, how would you, how would you change that? Like, how would you even get here? Um, when, you know, a lot of Americans don't want more immigration. I mean, you know, it's a tough one, right? I mean, you have, I think, with immigration, a somewhat flexible public. I think back in 2013, you know, this bill passes the Senate, bipartisan reform, huge, huge support, I think 80 votes, something like that. Uh, I think if House Republicans had wanted to get on board for that, like people would have said, this is great, like Barack Obama, bipartisan immigration bill, hooray. Instead, they they chose to go down a different route that then became the route Donald Trump took. Yeah. And that also works. You know, it, it works for them politically. Um, what are the reasons? Sometimes, you know, people on the left would be like, why, like, why do you have this whole frame about national power and greatness yeah. in China? Like, who cares? And one reason, though, is that it's hard to solve problems unless you have some level of buy-in across the aisle, in part for that kind of reason, right? That if you think about, you know, the Cold War era, right? If every decision had been made with sort of maximum cynicism and maximum divisiveness, like we wouldn't have come through that well. You needed on some level elite people on both sides to say, look, like this is important. We need to have broadly shared prosperity, right? We need to show communists that our system is actually better, Mm -hmm. right? So like there's going to be labor unions. There's going to be an equitable distribution of income. We're going to, like the civil rights movement made progress, you know, in part because of the like intrinsic justice of the message, in part because of the courage of the activists on the front lines, but in part because it made America look terrible in the eyes of the world, right? You had a decolonizing moment and like lots of propaganda from from the Soviets about like, these guys talk about freedom. And it was like, yeah, like we had to live up to American ideals, right? And people took that seriously. And if conservatives don't want to be more serious than Donald Trump about the nation, uh, I can't like stop them. But, like, you can see where we're going with that, right? Like, he has us on a trajectory of decline and chaos and division, and it's maybe helping get some tax cuts. uh, But it doesn't even seem that good for winning elections. So, you know, they might want to consider something different. So your argument for, like, one way we could get this is you're saying – conservatives, conservative elites may recognize kind of the geopolitical benefits, the kind of market benefits to companies and try to change or kind of affect cultural attitudes toward immigration. I mean, this seems like a very long-term process, but <laughs> is, that, is well, that how it would happen? You know, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, think more constructively about it, right? So just one thing that happens is conservatives say, okay, well, we shouldn't have all these family unification visas. We should let people in based on merit, uh, which, so, okay. I mean, it's a reasonable idea. A lot of countries have that kind of system. Uh, but in their bill that that um, Tom Cotton did and that Trump endorsed. Well, he also wants to cut legal immigration in half. Yeah. And that's not their political message, right? Like Trump was just at a town hall yesterday. And he's saying, oh, I love legal immigrants. Like I just don't want whatever. Um, and, you know, I think that message resonates with people, that people should follow the law, that you should have to go through legal channels. And now, you know, I'm a little more soft-hearted than that. I, 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 you know, and like a lot of people in the blue states think this kind of scapegoating of undocumented people is, is really unfair. But but that's the political message that works for Republicans. Cutting legal immigration is just like 
it's a Stephen Miller passion project and it has been his whole life because he's a crazy racist. But like, they don't need to do that, right? Like they could embrace some vision of a more skills-based immigration policy, but say like, let's have more people because like we're getting great people with, you know, amazing skills. Like one of the things I talk about is medical doctors, right? Because we worry all the time about healthcare in America. Mm -hmm. And there's like so much that's broken about the healthcare system. But one basic thing is that we pay the most for doctors, but we have not that many actual doctors per capita. And like, we know, like you can train doctors abroad and we could say, you know, you've got to pass some kind of test, right? You can it's not just anyone can show up and be like, hey, I'm a doctor now. Uh, but we could let foreign medical professionals qualify to work in the United States, come here, give them a visa, go knock yourself out, you know, and that would really address an important problem that's facing people while also growing the country. Yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the things that makes me skeptical about this though, is like, I think that the Trump era has sort of suggested very strongly that <laughs> a, a big part of the Republican base is motivated by racism or something close to racism. And I don't know if you can change that on kind of a visceral level, like people, some, a lot of Americans just don't want people who are different from them to come here. No, I mean, that, that is absolutely true. And it's, it's not great, but you know, there's a, there's a duality to it, right? Like they say, we want to make America great again. Uh, and, and I was interviewing uh, Veronica Escobar, a member of Congress from El Paso the other day. And she said, well, you know, when they say that, they just mean like make America white again. Um, and, and I think that is part of what they mean. Uh, but part of what they mean really is that they all want to make America great again, right? And what I want to show in the book is that there's incredible tension between those goals, right? That this nostalgia politics and this like exclusionary vision of America really undoes the project of greatness. I mean, and that's true in just a numbers game sense quantitatively, but it's also true historically, right? In big moments of challenge, we have usually been forced to become more inclusive. Because, because that's, that's sort of always been, uh, or more recently been kind of the, the obvious way of kind of winning the world you're saying. Yeah, well, and because it it holds us back, right? I mean, you yeah. know, I excluding African Americans from full participation in military service, you know, it like it hampered the country, right? Discrimination was costly. And the people who do it, right, the practitioners of racism, they feel, well, I'm getting benefits from this, right? That that white supremacy is is good for me, or you know, it pays psychic wages. Uh, but it has like tangible material harm to the country. And by being more inclusive, whether that's in an immigration sense, in a domestic civil rights sense, in terms of empowering women, right? Like that's actually how you create a stronger country. And, you know, so how does like change happen is a complicated question. Some of it is like you just win political fights with bad people. Some of it is you change hearts and minds. But some of it is like you emphasize different aspects of different problems, right? And it's just fundamentally not true that like demographic change is making the country weaker. Mm -hmm. But it is true that there's relative decline of the United States on the world stage. And this kind of little America thinking accelerates that decline. And I think that, you know, it behooves people who don't agree with this administration's approach to actually underscore that fact, right? To marshal like the all the arguments that we can, not just our sort of like nice guy, you know, yeah. humanitarian ones. Do you, I imagine one counter argument to this is we could be just as um, powerful on the world stage with our current population. Like even if China's bigger uh, and kind of gets to, um, you know, per capita GDP parity with us, we can still, or like approaches there. Um, we still have a large military. Like why can't we just sort of compete with them with our current size? Well, you know, I mean, I think military strength ultimately is a short-term thing, right? That the real foundations of strength 
are domestic. And it's about people. It's not just about how many people you have. It's about sort of quality, right? The strength of your institutions, all things like that. And, you know, I'm very taken with... um uh, when I was a kid, you know, I used to ask my my one grandpa uh, stories about World War II. He he flew on airplanes for the Navy. He was like a radio operator, and you know, there was a pilot and a bomber guy. And I thought those stories were great. And my other grandfather worked at the Office of Price Administration, and he helped organize boot rationing. And I thought mm -hmm. that was like the most lame, boring thing in the universe. And part of becoming an adult is recognizing that like the organization of boot manufacturing was actually probably the bigger way the United States contributed to that war that, you know, we needed boots for our soldiers, but also like English boots, the Soviet boots, like we were making all the boots. We were the arsenal of democracy, uh, was how FDR put it. And, you know, that's how America became a great power. The military came after the sort of large size and economic dynamism of the country. And now you see it with China, right? Uh, military strength is a lagging indicator for them too, because it's it's hard to train pilots. It's hard to build aircraft carriers. It's, you know, this stuff is is challenging, but they are catching up in that regard, just as they are in everything else. And if you're like little, right, like, you know, Sweden is really nice. I, I know a lot of left-wing people who, who love Sweden. I've been there. It's a nice place. It's just a little country, though. And like, they're never, they're never gonna like amount to anything in the world, <laughs> what, be, so being that small. Yeah, I mean, I think I think a lot of um, people on the left would say, well, so what? Like, we won't have world power. We won't have sort of geopolitical power, and maybe that'd be a better country, and maybe mm -hmm. we shouldn't be kind of the hegemon in the world, and we can be a little country, a happy little country. Yeah, and, you know, look, if the question was, like, is Sweden going to overtake us or Denmark or something like that, I'd say, okay, you know, America's, we made our share of mistakes, you know, maybe we should let somebody else take the wheel. Uh, but when you look at the sort of real alternative that's on offer, um, it's really not good. And like, I think you can say that with eyes wide open and no illusions about the history of the United States um, or some of our recent foreign policy failings, that what is happening in Xinjiang right now is horrifying, you know, like in a much more profound way than things that the United States has done in its recent past and that the trajectory is also quite bleak, right? That we, right. there was a tons of, and I bought into it, right? I mean, I used to be very much in the school of thought that was like, Bill Clinton gave this speech in 1999 where he said, well, we're going to trade with China and China's going to want to get wealthy. And part of getting wealthy is going to be like, they're going to want to use computers and the internet. And these are incredible engines of openness. Right. And, you know, so it's going to lead to democratization. And to me, like that made a lot of sense. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a technology person, but I, I like technology. And, and there it was. Um, it turns out that just like on the technical details, that was mistaken. It was totally possible to build this firewall <laughs> censored. I mean, internet. it's probably censorship now is probably easier than it was back then. Like, exactly. In many ways, it's made it more efficient. Right. So, so that was like a wrong call. <laughs> and, and right. No, and, and really like catastrophically yeah. wrong, right? Because like you've got cell phones, right? So right. now everybody is monitored. And mm -hmm. so they have an authoritarian system there that is getting more powerful and more entrenched domestically. And it's becoming more aggressive sort of on the international stage. And, you know, I just, I ultimately don't think it's correct or responsible really to think that America is so rotten that just kind of shrinking away from that is going to make the world better on net. The, so, so we need to be a big, powerful country because the alternative is China. And if they're, if they're kind of in charge, that would be bad for us also, if we're a little country. Yeah, and, and bad for the world, you know, and bad for, bad for our allies and things, you know, that, you know, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, like they don't have the ability to match China toe to toe, right? They depend on alliances with the United States and they want the United States to, you know, like be there, right? As a major actor on the world stage. And you see, I mean, that's another strength America has is that 
not everyone around the world, but many people around the world uh, would like to sort of, you know, be our friends or yeah. this is more, probably more technical diplomatic term if we get one of those people in here. Um, but, you know, so that's good. I mean, that's like a good thing we have going for us. Uh, but it also means that I think we gain benefits by having a sort of strategy for national leadership. Right. Right now, we've been looking very, um, I think, erratic is the word people use to be polite, Uh, seem like a country of crazy people. Uh, But if the alternative to this sort of like blustery nationalism becomes like, well, we're just going to decide we're like really down on ourselves and, you know, maybe the world will be better off if somebody else takes charge. You know, that's just like another sort of blow to to confidence and, and a problem globally. We have a couple of questions for the audience. Um, So one of them is, Matt, why not 6 billion Americans? While writing this book, what led you to believe that 1 billion is the right target today? Is it a matter of, polit- and is it a matter of political reality? Um, you know, 6 billion could be even better. I, I was trying to pick a number that I thought was ambitious enough to be interesting, uh, but also realistic when you got down to think about it, right? So at Mm -hmm. a billion, we have the population density of France. Uh, France is a nice country. A lot of Americans have been to France. Uh, It's beautiful, Paris, vineyards, you know, cool stuff like that. It also means really just elevating our population growth rate to what it was in the baby boom years, probably with fewer babies and more immigrants, but around that, Mm -hmm. sustain it to 2100 and then you get to a billion. It's about Canada's population growth rate. If you sustain it for a while, uh, we get to a billion. So that's where it is. You know, six billion, um, there's not enough people who even want to immigrate to get to six billion. So it's a little hypothetical. You know, it would be interesting, like maybe one day everyone will wake up and say like, oh, I'd like to have eight children. Um, that sounds like a lot. I've got just one. I can't, I can't imagine eight. Uh, but I do. My, my wife has a cousin who I think has nine kids. So, you know, these, these things happen. The world could get weird. I don't have a principled objection to six billion, I guess is what I'm yeah. saying. It just um, seems a little outlandish. You, you mentioned something that I, I was wondering about, which is how do we even know that that many people would want to come to America? There was this poll, uh, the, a Pew poll yesterday about sort of attitudes to America all around the world. And they're kind of at historic lows. Um, do a lot of people want to come here? Yeah, I mean, it's not 100% clear. You know, something people ask me about sometimes is like, well, you know, what do you think about like open borders? And I'm slightly against open borders uh, for sort of political reasons. But it is worth saying, I mean, the Gallup survey is about 135 million people around the world say they would like to leave their home country and America is where they want to go. Um, so that's less than a billion. Now, yeah. there's more people who like their first choice might be you know, France or Canada, but they, they would settle for America. So I don't think we know what the hard cap on the number of people who might like to immigrate is exactly, but it's not, in some ways it's fewer than most people might think, right? There's right. a, there's a certain paranoia in the American discourse that we're going to be like, quote unquote, flooded uh, with immigrants, right. which I think is just actually probably not true. There's a lot of people who would like to move here, but it's a, it's a finite number of people. Um, Another audience question. So how does this all play out politically? This couldn't possibly be a way of wiping out Republican districts, would it? Nah, (laughs) no one would use immigration to to rig the democracy. I I think they're they're arguing that you just want a lot of people here to to vote Democratic. Yeah, I mean, I think that Republican pessimism about their ability to win votes from people of color is a little unwarranted, but also has been very destructive in America, right? It becomes a cycle. Like if you start saying to yourself, like those people are never going to vote for me. Well then like, of course they really won't. Um, But you know, if you look at the current polling, Trump is doing better with African-American and Latino people than he was in 2016. Now he's still not doing very well, uh, but he's doing better. Right. And it's like Donald Trump, is doing that. Right. <laughs> Someone who has, I think, not made a really strong effort to be uh, reassuring and inclusive. His whole problem vis-a-vis Biden is white people have turned against him because he's a, he's a clown and sometimes white people get it together. Good for us. Um, so, you know, you can, you, you can make it, you can make it work. Uh, and it makes me sad. Like I saw, um, 
Mitch McConnell was saying the other day, well, if we make Puerto Rico a state, like Republicans yeah. will never have the Senate. Uh, Puerto Rico has a, you know, a non-voting member of Congress right now who is a Republican. Um, right. And like, I felt bad for her too, because it's like, just like do the work, you know, like you can right. get people to vote for you. Um, another one, how would you deal with Putnam's findings that diversity can reduce social trust and social capital? Uh, America is losing these now. How do we avoid that accelerating? Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, so Brian Kaplan has done some interesting work on this, just kind of like reanalyzing the Putnam data. Um, and it's true, diversity does lead to less trust. Um, but the magnitude is smaller than like a small change in the home ownership rate um, or just the age spectrum of things. So it's not like a, a death blow to social uh -huh. trust uh, uh -huh. to have more diversity in, in your neighborhood. Um, and there's also a question about like, you know, what's the chicken and the egg in there, right? right. Like it's, it's, you know, that's a study that's done at one point in time. And like, well, why do people have less trust in a diverse neighborhood? Like, is that something we should just accept as, you know, an indelible fact of, of human nature? Right. Um, I, I live in a diverse neighborhood. My, my kid goes to a diverse kindergarten. We um, have to be dealing with weird virtual kindergarten right now, uh, as as do many That's families crazy. around the country, uh, which, which is tough, you know. And so we wanted to um, uh, put something together in my house. We've got a garage so we can have outdoors and ventilation, but also a, a roof. Um, and so my son and seven of his, his classmates are in there. And, you know, it was true, right, that if we just sort of let the chips fall with no forethought, I think we might have ended up with a very sort of homogenous subset of the class. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're like committed to like being members of a diverse community. So we took the step to make sure we had a diverse group in our homeschool pod. And like now we do. And I think that, you know, builds trust ultimately. I don't think, I, I guess to say like, I don't think we need to accept this statistical finding as like our fate that like people can't cooperate across racial lines. Right. I mean, one of my, uh, one of the uh, sort of counter, one of the counter arguments to sort of anti-immigration people that I always think of is like, we had open borders for a long time in America. And it, 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 it didn't like, it wasn't the reason, that, you know, we had a civil war. It wasn't like, it didn't break the country apart. It didn't. Um, and for, um, and, you know, I think that we did have places and periods of our, um, during that time where there was social trust. I don't think that it, it um, sort of was a death knell to kind of community building or like the, the building of a great nation. Right, I mean, you know, it's like, these things ebb and flow to an extent, right? But particularly from a, a national point of view, I think the presence of 11 million people who have been here for a long time and are integrated into American communities but don't have legal status and now are sort of subject to like sine waves of enforcement intensity and, and now the pressure's on and it maybe yeah. will come off again, that to me really erodes the national community, right? And having legal pathways for, you know, for people who are here to, to get legal and regularize their status if they, you know, pay back taxes or whatever. And in the future to have like a process that people can go through to qualify and come here legally, um, that to me will build like a stronger community than the existing process where it's treating desire to migrate as illegitimate you know, it creates a lot of problems, right? We now have all these questions with, with the asylum applicants of like, well, is it a legitimate asylum application or do they really just want to come here because uh, it's a good way to get a job and have a higher standard of living? And like, I don't know. <laughs> and like, that's not care? the like, worst like, reason like, in the world. That's a, that's yeah. why my family <laughs> came here. But right. even like it was both, right? So, you know, on my mom's side, I'm, I'm Jewish. And by today's standards, they would have to prove that really they were afraid of persecution from pogroms. And the fact that they could get higher jobs was like just a coincidence, right? But uh -huh. you ask them, and you ask my Papa Morris, it's like, well, why did you come here? He wouldn't pick just one reason. You know, like it's common sense. It's like, you don't do these things right. simplistically I, or blindly. Uh I, I was born and grew up in apartheid South Africa. And, you know, like, so it was a, it, it was 
um, freedom wise and sort of liberty wise, like much better to come to America. But I, that is not the main reason my parents left. I mean, they just thought that they could have a better uh, living in America. Like they thought it would be a fun, adventurous thing to do. There were lots of different reasons and sort of like political persecution was somewhere on the list, but we, I don't think we would have been granted asylum if we tried, you know, we weren't. Um, right. It's yeah. it's weird to squeeze people through these hoops because then mm-hmm. you're just saying, oh, he's lying. And like, well, right. people don't people don't like it if you feel like someone's lying or breaking the rules or cheating the system. But if you create a system where honest answers like, well, we just think it's going to be better, all things considered. Yeah. Like if that doesn't qualify you, well, then, of course, people have to lie. Yeah. Um, uh, audience question. Um, are you concerned about the climate change impacts of what you are asking for? Yeah, I mean, this is a big question that a lot of people have, and I think it's a valid concern. Um, I think if you think about it holistically on a few different dimensions, you can alleviate some of these concerns. One of them is that when you look at the costs of climate change, the costs are not primarily born in the United States of America and other wealthy Northern Hemisphere countries. The really high costs are in island nations, they're in the tropics, they're in coastal flooding zones. And so when you let people migrate, you've reduced the the cost of warming, right? Which is one important thing because, you know, I think most scientists think 1.5 to 2 degrees of warming is probably baked into the cake already. And, And it may be more than that. And how much it is is a little bit out of our control right? Like the United States is a major contributor to climate change, but we're only 15% of global emissions. We can do what we can to reduce domestically, to foster international cooperation, but we can't, you know, you could put I don't know who, you know, Ed Markey, AOC could be president tomorrow, and she can't guarantee uh, that the world is going to address this. Secondarily, when you think about the barriers to addressing climate change in the United States. So much of it now is really just about deployment, right? We have more energy efficient ways of building and of heating and, and cooling homes. We, But we have to build the homes that do yeah. them, right? Like my house is not a state of the art passive house, uh, whatever thing. It was built in the 1880s. Uh, but when I just wanted to get like more energy efficient windows put in, because, you know, trying to be a good person. Uh, the historic preservation people told me I couldn't because mm-hmm. modern energy efficient windows don't look old uh, and the building's got to look old. So, okay. Um, they did let me put solar panels up, but that was like a fight all to its own. Um, so these are the same kinds of challenges that stand in the way of population increase, right? Is we have so many systems in place that stop us from building things, that stop us from saying yes to new infrastructure, new transmission lines, new housing, all those kinds of things. So there's a complementarity there. Uh, there's an ease on the kind of migration piece. Last, the biggest reason that a billion Americans exacerbates climate change is that it lets people raise their incomes. Uh, So there's no doubt, you know, you come from Haiti and you move to Miami, your emissions go up Uh, and your emissions go up because your income goes up. Your emissions actually go up by less than your income goes up. You know, the the carbon intensity Um, metric is good. So I don't think keeping people trapped in poverty can be the answer to climate change. I don't think that works ethically. I don't think it works politically. It doesn't work internationally, right? Like we can't just go to India. We can't go to Prime Minister Modi and say, well, we'd really like it if you guys just like didn't have cars or electricity. Uh, It would make our environmental problems a lot easier to solve. You know, he's gonna look at that. He's gonna say, well, I don't care, frankly, right? Like Mm -hmm. we, we need to find ways to do these things in an ecologically sustainable manner and like take that to the world. And, and at home too. Uh, but if we can't do that, just sort of asking everyone to exercise restraint is not going to get the job done. Um, yeah, that makes sense. It, it just seems like if, if, if we have, um, if we're going to have like one political project uh, over the next 20, 30 years, um, one thing to solve, uh, I feel like a lot of people would choose climate change over uh, getting more people in in the U.S. And and it seems hard to be able to do both. (laughs) Well, that's the thing, right? So, you know, there's one group of people who's like, yeah, I want to pick climate change. Um, But of course, there's another group of people who really don't think that, right? So, you know, if your view is, okay, well, we're going to just like win 
and govern the country uh, indefinitely <laughs> with these progressive priorities that conservatives completely reject. Um, I mean, I don't know. Good luck. Like, I, I would. This is somewhat my book says, and I do want to sell books, but I, I agree with progressives politically. I would not be so upset if Republicans just never won an election again or something, but this is a nonpartisan event. Um, But I don't think, you know, as a writer, a thinker, an intellectual, like, I just, that to me is not a realistic vision for what's going to happen in the world, right? So I think it's interesting to, like, play with some ideas that I think can get some buy-in, that aspects of it appeal to conservatives, aspects of it might appeal to liberals. It's things we could argue about the details, but sort of work on on the framework of. Maybe, you know, maybe we settle for 750 million Americans, something like that. Come in a little short, but, you know, people might still still buy a few copies of the book. Uh, But to me, like, that's just a big part of the problem with – climate as a generational struggle like you have to actually convince people on the other side that this is a problem worth confronting for that vision to happen a lot of people have written uh, books along those lines but i don't think they've quite like moved the needle in politics yeah well um i mean how will like one thing i wonder about is how will you sort of how did how does a political process sort of start on this goal? Like, does it take a president to do it? Like, how can we have this be our national goal? Um, you know, you probably you need like a meaningless sense of the Senate resolution to say like, <laughs> we, should, we should do this, yeah. right? Um, and, and people start going. I mean, I think, you know, obviously people should ask the candidates of the debates about my book. It should get just tons of attention and everybody buys it. Uh, that's how it goes. Um, no, but I mean, I, I think that, yeah, it's, you know, did we have an official process, like goal setting process to say like, we're going to settle the West? Uh, I don't know that we did exactly. Like people look back in history books and like, oh, there was this editorial in the New York Tribune. Um, Mm -hmm. But like how many people read that New York Tribune? (laughs) I don't know. Maybe it was super popular, went viral and (laughs) stagecoach at distribution. Uh, But you know, like political goals become sort of emergent properties of the system. I do think that we, you know, expect politicians to address like China on the international stage. They're supposed to say something. And right now what they say, like, it doesn't make any sense. You know, like you could ask Biden, you could ask Trump, you could ask anyone and they'll kind of like mumble something. Right. And so like, Maybe someone should give an answer to that 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 makes some kind of sense. Say, like, look, we're going to grow our national population and maintain our lead without counting on China to start impoverishing itself for no reason. And then we can start having discussions about, like, well, what falls out from that, right? What changes do we need to make? Out in California, I mean... I think the housing situation there has gotten quite bad. Uh, fortunately, bad enough that it's it's a topic of discussion. You know, I, you write columns about it. Uh, your colleague Benny Applebaum does. Uh, the duplex bill, unfortunately, failed in the state legislature, right. but it, it came really close. Mm-hmm. Like Gavin Newsom <laughs> did a state of the state address about it. And, you know, I don't think anybody ever said, okay, here's the day when we decided to start taking housing seriously in California. But it has happened over the past few years that this topic has been on the state agenda. Some battles have been won by reformers, some have been lost, but I think like the battle will be ongoing, clearly. And like that's good, right? That's that's the change we need. Where like do you see a particular um what do you think is sort of the easiest piece of this to start with? Like, it's the easiest start, piece to start with? Yeah, do you start with, like, just more open immigration? Do you start with kind of housing? Like, how do you sort of start on this project as, a, as you know, a, a real um, policy goal? Well, so I think one of the easiest things that may actually happen, although they won't use this phrasing, is, you know, there's going to have to be another COVID relief. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I think clearly, you know, say Biden wins the election. Democrats need to do something January, February on this. Um, So they're going to want to put some ideas in to get money into people's hands. Senate Democrats, all of them, have signed on to a bill called the American Families Act that would give, I think, $500 a month to parents of young children. Um, And it's offset in some way. Uh, So this would be a great thing to actually just put into a stimulus bill. Right, like start doing that right now, and maybe you can offset the pay for. You know, Congress is complicated, uh, but there's a way to do it. Uh, I was talking to you know friend works on the Hill talking about this, and he was saying like, yeah, you know, I think we're going to try to do permanent 
family allowance uh, in a COVID relief bill next year. So if that happens, right, that should, I think, um, some of the researchers that I looked at generate about like 0.2 extra uh, babies per family on a oh. permanent basis. Uh, so that's not like all the way to a billion, uh, <laughs> but it's it's a significant change actually compounding over the long term. And it's very realistic short term political possibility, right? Uh, then the other piece is immigration, right? So who knows what's going to happen? But like the Democrats all say they want a comprehensive immigration bill. Uh, the 2007 and 2013 versions of comprehensive immigration re- reform created larger legal immigration pathways. Uh, so like that could, you could imagine both of those things, child allowance, increased immigration, like they could happen next Congress. And then we're, we're on the road to a billion. Yeah. Um, okay. I think this is this question is related to what we were talking about uh, a few minutes ago. So the U.S. is a population pressure valve to solve the poverty of other countries by bringing them in. That's a sacrifice. Um, it, this is a question. Is that a sacrifice Americans should make for others? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it is a sacrifice, right? I mean, I think it's very positive sum uh, that we see that when foreigners move here from poor countries, their income goes up four, five, or six-fold, uh, in some cases, yeah, eight-fold even, but you know, let's be, be realistic. Um, so they do much better themselves. Um, and people who come here, especially from low-income countries, they send a lot of money back home in the form so it helps the people who are back there, particularly in more agricultural societies. Relief from population pressure actually is useful. There's, there's more land. Uh, it also uh, spurs human capital if people know that they can come here, right? People train and they sort of aspire to do that. You see that in the, the Indian technical universities especially. Um, so that becomes a win for for the migrants, it becomes a win for the sending countries, but it's also a win for America, right? I mean, uh, the cliche way to say this is that like so many of our biggest high growth companies were in fact founded by immigrants, right? So we are not yeah. like competing for jobs with immigrants. They're creating jobs. They're creating the entrepreneurial activities. But you see other things like that, like home values are higher in metro areas, that have diverse populations, right? Because they create more um, cultural amenities, right? I mean, I think in the most basic sense, like more restaurants uh, that people want to eat at. Like if you want to say like, how has American life improved over the past 40 years, right? It hasn't been a great time for wage growth. There's been a lot of problems, but our food is way better. Um, and that's almost exclusively because of immigration. Uh, but then, you know, there's other modalities to that, right? So you see more um, depth of skill mixes, people who, uh, so people can get better jobs because immigrants are there providing unskilled labor uh, in many cases. And it turns like English language competency into something that has value. So it's a very, I think, mutually beneficial kind of thing. The downside to immigration is that some people like sincerely don't like foreigners. And, like, I think we should take that seriously, like, the cranks who don't want to press one for English, like, that's, that's an authentic value on their part. They would like to think that immigrants are also economically costly, because they want to say, they want to deny that indulging their bigotry imposes costs on the country. But the fact is, it does. Like, yeah. immigrants are, are good for America. I, I mean, I think you can make those rational arguments, and I certainly um, believe in them. But I think that, it, you know, the way that people, the reason that people um, oppose immigration is often for kind of more visceral reasons. And like, you know, um, just racism and bigotry can be part of it. But, um, you know, it's probably a big part of it. But even in, you know, very progressive places in San Francisco, I see people making arguments all the time about just not changing the character of their neighborhoods. Mm-hmm, right. kind of like <laughs> keeping it the same. And so, and they don't think they're being um, racist or bigoted or just xenophobic in any way. They just kind of want it the same. Like, I, and I, I don't know, like I haven't found a good way to convince these people that like change might be good and take a leap. But like, how do you, <laughs> how do you change that kind of um, longing for, I don't know, nostalgic view or a vision of just like keeping things how they were, how local character is? 
I mean, it's a it's an interesting question. You know, um, somebody suggested they did a, a kind of joint uh, review of of my book and uh, your colleague Ross Douthat's book on on decadence, uh, which is interesting. You know, I've I've known Ross a long time. He's much more politically conservative than I am, uh, but I think this sort of shared point there, right? That like you can have a society that is just dominated by fear of change, and that is not a healthy development, right? I mean, it's not, I, I think you could be, there's progressive people who feel that way, right? The like big historic preservationists, like community control people, and there's there's right-wing people who feel that way, and, and they express it differently. But if you think about like our best times, uh, there are times when America was dynamic. And one of the weird things about MAGA nostalgia is it's nostalgia for a time at which things were changing more rapidly, than they are now. <laughs> right. Right. Like, you know, so like, yes, they want to go back, but like the 60s was a very, 50s and 60s were a very disruptive time. Like all kinds of new technologies were coming online. It was a bigger deal for productivity advancement, displacement of workers, uh, like huge suburbs were just like built out of farmland overnight. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people, people liked it and people are nostalgic for that time, but you can't achieve progress by literally going back. You have to take inspiration from things that happened in the past. And there were times when we were more open to the idea of like things happening. And, you know, that was, that was good. And even when people talk, you know, people in San Francisco or, or New York, where I'm from, uh, are often nostalgic for a time when the cities were more affordable and mm -hmm. were a little sort of funkier and there were like more artists and stuff like that around. And so then they think, well, if we kept all the buildings the same, like we can bring back the magic of the 90s or something. Okay. But that's not how it works, right? Like it was the affordability that made it nice, right? And to have affordability, you need like excess structures. And so that means like we got to let people build more stuff. We have a question on that, on development. Um, Matt, should we be concerned that only uh, big developers are building in big cities? What can we do to encourage more cheap, small apartments uh, by smaller developers? Uh, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, this is a big thing about having a very onerous permitting process, right? If to get anything built, you have to jump through a million hoops and you don't really know what the rules are and you sort of got to call in a favor from the city council member, that encourages all the development to go to sort of a small number of big, locally-based, well-connected companies and really their value added is that like they know the political process, mm -hmm. right? Not that like they know one guy who can like hammer some nails in, uh, but that they know how to go through the board of zoning approvals. Right. When you create a rules-based process, right? Where you say, look, like, I don't know. Like I, I, I met a guy in an airplane one time. Who, I was telling him about something I was working on about zoning. And he said like, son, you'd love Houston. I could put a nickel spelting plant next to a school and no one could say anything <laughs> about it. And like, that doesn't sound like a good idea to me. Yeah. Right? Like that, <laughs> that sounds, that sounds unsafe. I'm not, I'm not that libertarian. Um, but if you have rules that are like, okay, this is a place where houses can go. And if you want to build a house, it has to be a safe house. Like it needs to follow some structure so it doesn't fall down and it needs a smoke alarm, whatever. But like, you can just go do it. Right. That's a situation which an entrepreneur, right, a guy who's a skilled craftsman, a builder, a guy who knows construction, who has done a couple jobs, he can put out his own shingle and say, like, I'm a developer now. I'm going to build a house. Um, you can't do that now right? Because the permitting process is too complicated and it's too politicized and only a real expert in there can do it. And I think ideally you want to move to a situation in which it's like, people will say like, what is a developer even? There's just guys who know construction, right. right? Like construction experts will build houses and a developer might be like weird, like out like in some greenfield situation, if you needed to like create a whole neighborhood from scratch, maybe a quote unquote developer needs to do that. But like in an urban neighborhood, it's just like, just build the house. Like, I don't know how to build anything, but like there are people who know the construction industry and they should be the ones building the houses. Yeah, I mean, I think one one interesting thing about this is that you're um, you would need to kind of have, in some ways, kind of deregulation at the local level 
um, while at the same time kind of uh, changing the rules in the opposite way at the national level. Um, it, it's sort of a, it, it would be difficult, I think, for a single political party to take this on. Um, mm -hmm. It seems to, it seems to need kind of everyone to have buy-in on it. Ryan, yeah, well, but also state governments can do a lot, right? I mean, you know, it, it would be um, not politically easy, but logistically easy. For example, for California to say, look, we're going to have much stricter rules against building a house in like fire zones, which seems like a really big problem. But at the yeah. same time, we're going to say, look, where it's safe, like there's no forest fire in Santa Monica, right? right. So, but there's just like a rule against building apartment buildings, so, right. you know, it's like the state government can pull both of those levers simultaneously mm -hmm. and say, okay, what are our high level goals here, right? We need safety. We want to like not consume open space. So we're going to have infill, right? So we need to reduce regulations on infill building and make them stricter on sort of sprawl type building. Um, you know, that varies a little bit from place to place in the Northeast. We tend to like cut across state boundaries in a slightly weird way. Uh, but I really think state governments can sort of lead the way on housing issues. Um, I think we have just a few more minutes left, but I guess one thing I want to know is, um, has anyone ever done this? Like how, what is kind of the track record for countries experiencing such, uh, such huge growth? I mean, we did, uh, uh, in an earlier time, but, um, you know, in more recently, has this happened? You know, I think America is the, the number one growth success story. Uh, France in the 19th century, to an extent, there was mostly domestic births. Uh, a guy named Jules Ferry was very interested in, in this kind of thing there. Um, you, you see efforts at sort of pro-natal policy from some of the uh, weird right-wing governments in Central Europe right now. It mostly doesn't work, though, because they want to focus on promoting traditionalism, uh, you know, um, and just like rewarding stay-at-home moms, uh, which is fine, I guess, but it, it just mostly produces backlash. You know, you yeah. need you need to sort of accept people in their modern lifestyles and like help them uh, go and, and live them. Uh, you know, a, a different way, like Singapore was a big population growth story through immigration, right? They, it's very complicated sort of how they, they built that country up and it's a small country in, in the scheme of things mm -hmm. uh, but those seem to me like the big examples of intentional doing of it but we've also had periods of explosive population growth in places like Hong Kong you know which through kind of happenstance came to have big influxes of people and it usually works out pretty well uh, if people are coming someplace because the local institutions there are appealing mm -hmm. uh, having more people makes the institution stronger yeah. Okay. I think this is going to be our last question, and it's from the audience. Um, Matt, I see one billion as an inherently optimistic vision. Is significant population growth necessary for America to actually be greater? Yes. I mean, it is an inherently optimistic vision. I mean, this is the point. I mean, I yeah. think, like, yeah. if, I, if yeah. I want to just, like, you know, sell books, right? Like, this is such a downer time. Like, so much, like, terrible stuff is happening. Like, psychologically stressful stuff, emotionally stressful stuff. Um, and it was nice for me to have gotten to spend a fair amount of this time thinking about uh, optimism, right? Thinking about big vistas and America being all it can be. Um, you know, like a, a sort of not a Pollyanna ish view of America as it is, but looking at the very real strengths that this country does have and how can we make the most of them and how can we be the best that we can be. And like, yes, it poses second order problems, but there are problems that themselves are solvable. Uh, I think it is fun to think about the idea of actually solving problems and being constructive and trying to be a better country instead of just like fighting, fighting, fighting with each other all the time. And then, you know, you finish the book, you get to go back to reality where you uh, maybe can't go outside or yeah. <laughs> see your friends or whatever else. I mean, but like uh, the current situation is such a bummer. Like we, we could do better than this. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, thanks to Matthew. I'll say Matthew. Thanks to Matthew Iglesias, <laughs> co-founder and senior correspondent at Fox and author of One Billion Americans, The Case for Thinking Bigger. Uh, we encourage you to pick up your copy of Matthew's new book at your local independent store. Uh, if you'd like to watch more virtual programs or support the Commonwealth Club efforts, please visit www.commonwealthclub.org. I'm Farhad Manju. See you next time.
Thank you.